So it's yeah. only a matter of time that, I mean, actually, I don't want to jinx it or anything by saying CNN is going to be talking about detransition in like six months, you know, but oh, yeah. it's all over like Fox. I was like the other day I got a call from Dr. Phil's producer oh. and you know, there was some, t- there's, so we're in talks about doing a show on the trans cult sure. and the producer, like, you know, they're a producer. So they're like talking really, really fast and just like getting, getting it all out. But in the first like couple seconds, they said the word trans cult. And I was like, oh my God, like they're going to go there. Like uh, that's where, that's where my head space is yeah. at as someone who's been in this for years now. But yeah. the fact that Dr. Phil and his show He's are going to do a cult. show about the trans cult, like it, it was so refreshing. It just, it felt so like, wow, I'm seeing other people like come online and like, it feels, it doesn't feel as isolating. Yeah. And then he just went on Joe Rogan and just <clears throat> like turfing it up. Hello, Laura Becker. So we were just joking before the recording that we, we've done this before in our own little podcast. So um, it's nice to see you again. It's always nice to see you, Vincent. Yeah, yeah. We were, we were both um, fiddling with our backgrounds, but I, I see we've found something that matches our, our traits. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if you're quite as put together as that background assumes. No, I wish I could manually like move the pillows around or something. But anyway, you know, my, my creative spirit needs to be contained a little bit, you know. <laughs> right. And I, well, I have enough color popping and yeah. I have a nice kind of gecko I love over it. here. I love it. The colors are really, I really like those colors. Yeah, uh, I like them. And I love your, your top is appropriate. So. Yes, because the top is more neutral. The colors are, you know, I've, I've learned that now I'm not as autistic as I used to be where I'm like <laughs> every, like, I didn't understand how to balance the neutrals with the colors. And just patterns. A couple of but our yeah. recordings on, on the, on, on the, the trans psyche pod I'm talking about for those who don't know that Laura and I did uh, a couple of years ago now, two years ago. Um, there, there were a couple of recordings where you came on with very flamboyant top, you know, and I was like, that's Laura. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, this is one of my merch, but I mean, this sweatshirt comes in like 15 different colors. Uh, I just don't have like any gray. So I'm like, I'll just get a gray one. So, and this one I designed kind of for, for supporters. Uh, I do have D-trans specific ones, like for D-transitioners. Obviously, like I stand with D-transitioners. I am a D-transitioner and I stand with them, but this is something that people can wear without people you know seeing it and being like wait are they a detransitioner like no yeah. this is just a support a stand shirt. with yeah, yeah 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 so so maybe let me do a little quick intro uh like uh you know obviously you and i are very involved in this whole crisis let's call it um and i mean you know feel free to put your own language to this because i know we, we we come at it from slightly different perspectives obviously i'm the, the 50 year old uh straight white male from South Africa, um, who's traumatized by Marxism, and um, and 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 you're you're you, <laughs> you know. Um, but the, I think the one thing we agree on, at least uh, today, is that um, this idea that there aren't many detransitioners. I'm sick and tired of hearing this um, because it it uh, obviously I run the detransitioner support group uh, for BeyondTrans.org, and um, I hear through them, uh, even though there's not many people in that group, but I hear through them about the other detransitioners. So I'm very aware that there's lots of detransitioners out there. You know, if you think about how these networks kind of work, then you can assume that one detransitioner is connected to 20 others. And if those are connected to another 20 others, then that you've got a pretty significant network, you know? So um, I don't know, do you, how do you feel about that? Do you agree with that? Yeah, I mean, you know, and even what people label themselves as might not be under the term detransitioner. I mean, there's a lot of people that, you know, have psychologically deprogrammed from the trans ideology, or binary ideology, but they haven't, you know, yet returned to living, you know, publicly or socially as their birth sex. 
or there's a lot of desisters that, you know, were in the ideology and they did varying levels of social stuff, but didn't medicalize exactly. or who were going to medicalize and had, like had the prescription, but they just didn't. Like there's a lot of different laws to follow up. It isn't just like the, you know, there's only a few that are quite as public as I am about yeah. it, like speaking out, but there's uh, more lawsuits coming. Like there's tons of lawsuits, even just in my lawyer team that are, uh, being worked on and, and, you know, that takes a long time. Like there's a big, you know, there's a lag and a delay in coming in out that. publicly and especially um, at the scale that, you know, people like people are going to be like, okay, that one counts as a detransitioner, exactly. you know? Cause, cause even if we go back to our podcast now, I'm, I'm having flashbacks. Um, I remember you saying some lawyers contacted me. You know, and that was like 2021, you wow. know, and here we are, you know, um, I mean, I, I remember even at the time being, um, even me, I was concerned about the backlash of like, okay, coming on to a public platform, putting our necks out and talking about, okay, we spoke about a bunch of stuff in our podcast, but it, it was, it still made me a little bit nervous, but I'm pretty sort of. I've got this anarchistic spirit, you know, so I'm, I don't really shy away from these things. Um, but that was just two years ago, you know? Yeah. Uh, and you were pursuing your, your, your licensure yeah. at, at that time. You were still studying. It was a bit... and I was like, I was still studying too I, for an art degree, Yeah, that's right. <laughs> which sounds yeah. a lot less like, you know, you don't need as much certification and then there's less public scrutiny for that. Um, but still yeah. like, it's been, yeah, it's been over, it's been like two and a half years since we met. Yeah. Um, and that's, you know, so today I wanted to, you know, go over just from, I mean, just from last E-Trans Awareness Day and month, which is March, March 12th until March 12th of 2024 this year, there's been so many uh, hmm. successes as wins for the movement against gender ideology and i mean there's been just a lot of successes in general kind of against related mm -hmm. you know kind of uh marxist th there's so much and we're not going to get into all that but but yeah. specifically just for d-trans stuff we wanted to highlight a lot of the positives that are going on you know and i guess from my perspective like not just for my own catharsis but maybe for newer detransitioners that are maybe you know, just seeing this for the first time or just hearing about D-Trans Awareness Day this year, that they know that there's a lot going on. We've taken a lot to get here. And, you know, we're we're starting to make huge momentum in helping people and we still have work to do, but there's a lot going on behind the scenes. Yeah, I'm sure there'll be a lot to talk about next year. So this is just an uplifting kind of thing um, for everyone to just be like, mm. you know what? we have done good stuff okay like we have had success even though it's been a you know very difficult yeah so uh, so just to agree with you obviously we did speak about this before but um a couple of people that i spoke to to say that we were planning this um they were quite excited because i think everyone has lost track of what's going on and there's this sense of you know sometimes i talk to parents and the parents have the sense of despair because their child has maybe moved out of home and is very much um, embroiled in the uh, in the ideology and the medicalization um, and 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 you know sometimes there's worse things going on. But um, I have to sometimes remind them that you know two things. Okay, first of all, we can still have the conversation. Okay, at least we can talk about it now. You can reach out to me, for example. Um, you can reach out to other therapists. There's um, the old getter, but now called uh, therapyfirst.org uh, that lists all the therapists that will not affirm. Um, I mean, that's, that's massive progress. I remember when that was, there was only a few people on that site and now there's a bunch, you know, that have all agreed to the ethics, which are, by the way, original counseling and therapy ethics. This is not new ethics that have been sucked out of thin air, um, like affirmation was. Um, you know, just just I, I think I just have to put this in here. You know, affirmation is 
by definition, the opposite of respecting fluidity of gender. Okay, so if you believe that we should be allowed to be fluid with our gender, which I think is a kind of progressive idea, you know, I mean, you might not agree with that either, but I'm saying at least some people can come somewhere in between. Affirmation is literally, in, it's, in the, it's in the title, the opposite, you know. So, so to go back to original ethics should not be controversial, you know. And the fact that therapy now, oh, so, oh, sorry, um, uh, therapy first has grown so well um, is, a, is a sign that the profession is changing as well. And again, I think they represent another 20 and another 20 and another 20, you know. Um, so the general idea for us today is, like you said, I think it is a bit cathartic for us to say, okay, well, here we are. Um, but I think a lot of people watching this or listening to this will, will agree that at least we can talk about it openly. Um, there are some environments I know, uh, certain areas in America where you can't, um, but you can talk about it online. You know, if you can't do it like at your work, uh, I, I know some people, for example, that work at schools. Um, that can't bring this up because they'll get targeted. Um, but they can at least go online and find support groups. There's so many support groups now. Um, and there's people um, like me reaching out from the professional uh, perspective to, to, to help people, you know. And then obviously, like, I know we're going to go through the list now, but um, the fact that you're invited to speak and um, present your experience um, to sometimes thousands of people is, is incredible. It's absolutely incredible. You know, so should we should we start? Do you want to? Well, yeah, I think that that kind of segues in. I mean, we can agree that really the biggest win of, you know, this last year is just that, you know, the general public is starting to wake up and the huh. mainstream is starting to wake up. But certainly at this point, it's pretty much a dominating alternative media and independent media yeah. Yeah, online sure. discourse sure. like. Every single day on on Twitter, the hashtags had there's something to do with trans every single day. So that it's it's one of the hottest topics, and so it still hasn't broken, you know, a hundred percent into the mainstream. But as we'll kind of go through this list in kind of chronological order of, you know, because things change so fast, you know, week mm -hmm. to week and month to month. Um, so I guess I kind of I'll start. So. So yeah, starting out last March, uh, it was the only the second annual D Trans Awareness Day. Okay, so that's how fast everything has been happening. That's only the second one. Mm -hmm. This is the third this year. Yeah. Um, and we had the very first, you know, public in real life D transitioners panel. We had seven D transitioners in Los Angeles on March twelfth at uh, the LA Art Museum. I was there. And I posted that on YouTube and it, it throughout since a year has gone by, it's got over 900,000 views. And wow. so it's that it's getting like blowing up. It kind of went viral way more than all my other content. Um, but it's like, wow, you know, there's people really interested to just hear 70 transitioners just candidly talking. It was very loose format. Um, and that was in promotion of the film No Way Back. And yeah, since then, I, so many films have been released this year. A couple of the bigger ones were um, the Prager U documentary, D-Trans, mm -hmm. and the Epic Times Gender Transformation. Yeah. Um, and still, as we speak, there's there's more being made and there's many independent films. Um, this... And did, did, did What Is a Woman come out last year? Like, right? Yeah. That came out. Like that's yeah. huge. What is a woman? I don't even have that on the list. There's so yeah, many yeah. things. I was gonna I was gonna mention um Lost Boys just came out about the oh, yeah, Lost Boys transitioners. Yes. Um and then and the deep was... transition diaries. Yeah. About the uh, girls. Um, there was one um I don't know exactly what it's called, but there's a an Australian um I think it's the Australian AA. Anyway, the Australian TV channel, right. news channel. Um, that yeah, that was really big. good, really good, quite upsetting, but very good. Um, short, I think it's about 25 minutes. It's not very long, but it's very to the point. Um, that's what I liked about it. It was very like, it, it didn't get too distracted by the, because I think it's quite easy to get distracted by conversations about the studies and the, the methods and, the, and the, all this other stuff. You know what, at the end of the day, 
there's victims. They are victims of this. And that's my concern is, well, the victims get systematically erased. And I, there's another recording that I did with Magda from Poland that's going to come out the same day, 12th of March now, um, where she talks a bit, a, a bit more about that. Um, but, you know, the one way to see it is you must understand that when someone has gender dysphoria and they go to a gender clinic, they get a diagnosis of gender dysphoria and they get treatment and they get registered. But when they detransition, there's no diagnosis. There's no, yeah, there's no diagnostic code. No, that's been a big topic this year. Like in America, we, um, you know, have tried to work on some legislation and we're working on legislation mm. to, you know, create a medical code, a diagnostic code in the system so that people don't have to be lumping detransitioners under, you know, the trans yeah. umbrella, you know, that these people like me don't have to go back to our doctors, the same doctors who we felt harmed us or who were suing, you know, who are forgiving incompetent care that we can find, you know, yeah. other people that can treat our issues. Um, that's still, that's still something we're working on. But mm. I think, you know, I mean, there's been so many films this year, actually, another one's coming to mind that was just released, um, which is the, the War on Children. Uh, oh, yeah. And that one was very long, and it went into really, really strong detail about um the history of it with john money and and all these different yeah. things um so just like big media is being made about this yeah um and um as well like i think you know it's it's kind of hard to address every single thing but there's just been a ton of legislation this year in at least in the states um that i believe you know 23 different states have passed, um, you know, pro reality legislation, as I call it. A lot of it is banning or limiting uh, affirmation um, of gender mutilation for minors. Yeah. So this year, it kind of felt like this is the year where we're just getting a ton of political momentum. There's a lot of states now, about almost like half of the states in the US have. I saw been yeah. on, on the board with banning medicalization of minors. Um, and so a huge precedent has been set now to for other states to to copy that type of legislation. And now Amazing. states are starting to work together because uh, the states are very divided, you know. Um, and now what I'm hoping for this year is that there's going to be a more focus on uh, young adult, specifically college aged, because I think that the demographic that I fell into was that I was 18 in my freshman year of college when I came out as trans, 19 and 20 when I transitioned medically, mm. and then 22 when I detransitioned. And that's mm. very common. I mean, there's minors, but then a lot of them are young adults in the college indoctrination. And they're kind of falling through the cracks legislatively. Um so, but last year, mm. it's really set the precedent to be able to talk to people in the general public and legislators and say, um, we are not on board with this. Like, can we get on board with the fact that children should not be, you know, medicalized unnecessarily when they are still developing? Yeah. And as we've seen, that is the general consensus. And if you know, talk to people like be. Billboard Chris or Aaron Friday, who are like out on the streets talking to everyday people just in a very casual street context like yep. that is the that is the overwhelming opinion that a, the, the average person agrees with yeah so i i, I can I add um i'm not going to talk about it too much but i was going to mention the fact that in south africa so i live in sweden at the moment but i moved uh, from south africa in 2023 and in south africa there is an organization that's been formed um, called First Do No Harm South Africa, um, which is an amalgamation of two other groups that have had some success actually in South Africa with other issues um, related to uh, legislative uh, threats to norms, let's say. And again, keep in mind, South Africa has a, a kind of clash of traditional cultures with Western culture. So there's a lot of um, conflict potential there, you know. So these are, I'm, I'm very much behind these organizations that um, resist this kind of uh, elitist academic neo-colonialism. And, and I know that as soon as I say colonialism, people are going to be like, guys, I said neo-colonialism <laughs> because 
what's what effectively from our South African perspective is we're desperately trying to deal with our own problems. And out of the blue comes a new problem, you know, from uh, America's elite universities that is a postmodernist idea that needs to be installed urgently to meet the, uh, the agenda, you know, and like I've said before, anyway, um, uh, with, with some other stuff that I've done that uh, really woke 1.0 was 1994 in South Africa when we changed to the ANC led government. So we've been living under this kind of ideological paradigm uh, like other countries as well. I mean, it's not just South Africa, but we've been living under it for years. So, so introducing gender um, legislation to support, you know, uh, biological males going to, into female spaces is very much in line with that, um, which is what they're doing right now. So, so just to say that I was quite surprised when early this year I was con contacted by this group in South Africa and they heard that I run a detransition support group and they just wanted my input from that experience. So um, I've been quite happy to do that because they seem to be quite sincere. Um, and I just thought it was worth mentioning because, you know, really the population at risk in South Africa is really small of this ideology, the ones that are, are at risk. It's, it's a, you know, uh, it's a wealthy minority that's at elite schools and that kind of thing. Okay. But, but the fact that it's reached South Africa and the adults were able to, to rally organize, get money behind it, because it, it costs, um, well, in rands, it's about, I think it's about 500,000 rands to, to go to the high court. So it costs money, you know, um, and they were able to rally, nothing to do with me. I mean, I had nothing to do with that. I'm just being invited to provide my, my reflections based on dealing with detransitioners. Um, and I must tell you also, I wanted to tell you this, Laura, anyway, um, I've been contacted by detransitioners in South Africa. So there are already detransitioners in South Africa. So the fact wow. that, the, I think this is a very important point. The fact that when someone starts questioning, they can go online and they can go, I'm, I, I, I would, I'm thinking of detransitioning and there will be resources. Okay. Three years ago, that didn't exist. Three years ago, that did not exist. So you can thank whoever you see fit. I thank Jane Specht, okay? But anyway, I'm not going to start an argument about that. Um, <laughs> but certainly, uh, I know there's a couple of other organizations that have been involved, but um, the fact that you couldn't do that three years ago, what that literally in, in practice means to people that are in this kind of distress is that when they start feeling doubt, they get support to, to, to go, uh, you know, uh, safely and ethically into a different way of being, whatever that may be whatever that may be. Okay? I'm not saying that I know what's best for all these kids. They need to figure it out, but they, at least they get support because the common thing that I hear from detransitioners is, is that when they considered detransitioning, there was no support. If anything, they were being vilified instantly. They get, they get thrown out of support groups. If they're in a, de, a trans support group and they mention detransitioning, they get banned from the group immediately. So I just want to point that out that what we're doing has very real consequences on people that were otherwise victims of an ideology. They, they are, they, I think we forget about this. I think a lot of people get caught up in the arguments about, um, you know, female bodies and male bodies and the statistics and, the, and the, which method works and which one is risky and all that. You know, at the end of the day, they are victims. And if we just ask the victim, they'll tell you what hurt them. You don't need to do right. all these studies. Well, right. <laughs> I mean, I don't know. The, stu the studies are not the most petty thing that that people get caught up in, right? Not no. to get into it, but I, I mean, so, man, that brings up a lot. Like, one idea that came to mind is, like, it, Israel, right? It's just not that that's controversial at all to bring up. Yeah. Um, but I have some now Israeli desister and detransitioner friends oh. who now have reached out to me. So you know, it's very interesting, like the different places that that this same ideology is coming from, and it's coming from America. Um, like, for example, one of the one of the big wins that I had this year was when I went to the American Academy of Pediatrics annual conference in Washington, mm -hmm. D.C., with a group of other detransitioners and doctors from Fair and Medicine. Yeah. And what we noticed was that all of the international doctors, all of the doctors from other countries 
they were very, very curious and open to what we had to say versus the yeah. American doctors. A lot of them were self-censoring and, and anxious or even hostile. But all of the international doctors from other countries are like, okay, we're actually seeing what's happening in more of the westernized countries. And we're worried that it's going to come here and it's starting to come here. So it's interesting that the American and um, English like pipeline is mm. uh, trickling to these other places. But because now we have taken the initiative to create resources and awareness, yeah. it seems like there will be a lot of prevention in yeah. some of these other countries versus here we have, I mean, we're trying to do prevention, but we also have a ton of damage um, that we need to deal with the fallout, but we can help prevent things yeah. happening in other countries that have a delay in getting it. Yeah, so. I mean, just, just so so people don't get confused, because I think I can I can just hear some parents watching this and going, yeah, but I, got, I know, guys, the problem is it's actually escalating in certain spaces, this ideology. It's actually getting worse, because what's happening what I'm sensing is that um, the people that would resist are moving away from those areas. So as we go, you might end up with areas that uphold uh, affirmation in, 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 in a radical way and other areas that, that ban it or legislate against it or whatever. So and by I areas, you mean cities or states? Cities or states or, 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 or whatever. That's what I'm hearing. I'm hearing about parents who are planning to leave the state they live in because they cannot deal with this. And maybe they've already written off uh, helping their child directly, but at least by taking a stand and at least not supporting the state that is supporting this, you know? So what I worry about, what I'm getting at is what I worry about is that you're going to have these beacons of affirmation where uh, gender distressed kids are going to be drawn to those spaces. That's what worries me, you know? So I don't, I'm not really sure what we do about that, but at very least you'll have the neighboring state, like an, one parent, one father was, was telling me, he plans to live on the border because if he crosses the border, he can work. But if he, if he lives on this side, he's not going to be subject to this ideology because wow. it's not in the legislation. He said it's a difference of, I think it was 12 miles or something. I was like, that's crazy. You know? Yeah. So just just wow. to acknowledge that's that that's what the parents idea. are worried about. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I want to keep this mostly positive, but it is, you know, very interesting that you know, obviously it's such a battle um, mm. in certain areas it that is. are so yeah. uh, captured, but I feel like a win that we've had this year in general is starting to expose the the elite universities that are, are pushing yes. a lot of these things. Now, it's mostly been focused on race or mm. there's been some religious stuff going on, but mm. it's gender is wrapped up in all of that too Absolutely. with the critical yeah. theory. It's the same thing. So people are losing trust in the, you know, the highest institutions, right? Like Harvard and people are losing trust in university and the price of college is so outrageous anyway, that now there's criticism of these institutions and there's been so much, win so many wins for parental rights this year. Yeah. Like parents just standing up in general to just, you know, various you know, kind of it's yeah, I it is more woke and very, you know, radical leftist authoritarian type ideology that they're mm. mostly standing up to. But even in general, even, you know, liberal or leftist people are still seeing the dysfunction and the cost and really just like the lack of, you know, genuine education that their children are receiving in state schools. Um, so there's been so much talk this year of parental rights. And I just love to see that as someone yeah. who um, isn't a parent, but, you know, plans to be and wants to homeschool. Like, I feel like I already have awareness to kind of prevent th certain things from happening. Um, but I think just in general, that's a huge win that there's criticism of K through 12 schools. There's criticism of the quality of education. There's criticism of the elite universities. And now because of the um, Israel events, there's really a strong criticism of college students themselves. Um, yeah. And I'm so glad I'm graduated. I, I'm so <laughs> glad to be out of it. Um, but now it's, even if it's not specifically about transgender or D-trans, um, people are waking up to it in general and saying, okay, that's, yeah. that's a bunch of mess. 
like Bill Maher, I've seen him go off this year. He is becoming so awakened. He's a, still a little behind, but like he and, and him and mainstream um, kind of old school classical liberals like that, like Joe mm. Rogan are, are completely talking about this and they're talking about gender. So it's yeah. only a matter of time that, I mean, actually, I don't want to jinx it or anything by saying like, oh, CNN is going to be talking about detransition in like six months, you know, but just, yeah. it's all over like Fox and, and, um, I know it's on your list Carlson and all that, but I know he's on your list, but I'm, I'm going to jump ahead. Cause you, you're on, you're on it right now. Dr. Phil. Yes. Yes. I mean, I, Dr. I was, Phil was, just happened. Yes. <laughs> I was like the other day I got a call from Dr. Phil's producer oh. and um, you know, there was some, t there's, so we're in talks about doing a show on the trans cult sure. and the producer, like, you know, they're a producer. So they're like talking really, really fast and just like getting, getting it all out. But in the first like couple seconds, they said the word trans cult. And I was like, Oh my God, like they're going to go there. Like yeah. that's where, that's where my head space is yeah. at is someone who's been in this, for years now but yeah. the fact that dr phil and his show He's are going to do a cult. show about the trans cult like it it was so refreshing it just it felt so um like wow i'm seeing other people like come online and like it feels it doesn't feel as isolating yeah um and then he just went on joe rogan and just Brilliant. was like turfing it up Brilliant. And was, I was like, it was I, it's one of the few nice podcasts that I sort of put everything on hold. And I was like, hold on, I need to listen to this. I don't, by the way, I don't listen to Joe Rogan regularly because he often covers stuff that I'm really not interested in. But that was one that I listened to from start to finish. And he was, I, I can say that, um, okay, there's some stuff related to America, which I'm not really, you know, caught up or, or interested in. But regarding this, he was spot on. So very, very happy about that. Yeah, I mean, and Dr. Phil, you know, I know he kind of has leaned more towards the conservative side of things. Um, but like, if you think about his viewers, like his regular, just every, everyday viewers, um, you know, what what would be my assumption of their kind of ideologies is they would be maybe more more moderate, right? They'd be a little yeah, more like center, so. center left or a little center yeah. right, like they'd be a little more moderate. They're not extremists. He covers a lot of different topics on his show, mostly women, probably mothers and um, who are interested in mental health. Yeah. And um, and I've been a fan of Dr. Phil's show for for years and years. Um, so I was like, that's it. Not only is he waking up and he has a huge influence and he has a new book coming out, yeah. which like he's like how do we save america's soul or whatever i'm like oh, jesus christ like i'm totally on board i can't wait to see what he has to say um and including this topic because i think he's genuinely concerned about yeah. it um but and he'll have enormous reach but just then his fans and viewers they are middle america they are the everyday so, yeah. person who probably is so a little you know open-minded enough right they're like interested in psychology they're interested in human nature. They want to understand things. These are the people that we really need to reach. So um, that was huge. And that only happened, um, you know, in February. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So that's like a fresh, like feeling of like, yeah, you know. I'm going to point out, I'm going to point out some things. And it's, it's, it sort of hit me this morning with, with something that happened on Twitter, but um some people are in denial about these things, okay? Uh, I think you and I spoke about this as well, but Camila Paglia, uh, a couple of years ago, she was, uh, or sh should I say, sorry, Camille Paglia, I keep mixing up some other names. Um, she in was interviewed with Jordan Peterson about, it's about six years ago now, seven years ago, maybe. And this, one of the things that struck me in that interview was she said, we need more masculinity in Western culture. We need like a revival, not of men, she didn't say of men, okay? She said of masculinity, okay? Because she feels that she's quite masculine in her approach to life as well. And it got me. And I mean, I, I, I suspect, I mean, I'm, I'm never really sure, but I suspect that's one of the reasons I chose to study because it happened just before I started studying. Um, and what, what I see when I see, first it was Jordan Peterson, okay? And everyone was like, wow, a, a masculine 
archetype. Okay, and I know you love archetypes. Um, <laughs> and mas- we both love Jordan Peterson anyway. A masculine archetype who's intellectual, who has the courage to speak in the Canadian Parliament 2016, and uh, and has not held back since, like for for five minutes, except those couple of months that he disappeared when he was sick, but um, which was very stressful for for lots of us. We were like, what are we going to do, you know? But now we have uh, Joe Rogan, Dr. Phil. For me, that video was exactly what Camille Paglia was calling for: a revival of masculinity in its in its in its in its evolutionary purpose. Okay, not I'm not talking about. I know we spoke about this earlier. Um, I'm not talking about um, masculine because if you if you break it down, if you say masculine aggression, then yes, that still makes sense. But what I'm talking about, and what a lot of us on the male psychology side of things, what we talk about is the real function of masculinity in the survival of the human race. Okay, in our role in society as the male and as the female. Okay, not not a lot of people get very wound up in what the modern role mod, role um, the capitalist induced role of gender. Okay, which if you go back 200 years, didn't exist. Okay, if you go, well, maybe you need to go back a little bit further, but pre-industrial revolution, our roles were very different. Okay, and I know other people, this is not the original thoughts of mine, obviously. Other people have spoken about these things, but I think we need to remember that, that the way we think men behave is based on what we think we've perceived in the last 50 years. Okay, but in reality, there are certain uh, traits that each sex holds and uh, certain functions that they have. So the revival of this kind of pro-social masculinity that you can see, if you ask me, if you watch that Joe Rogan and Dr. Phil being guys, that's what they're doing. They're being guys. And um, there's an element of that rogue male thing that I wrote about a while ago of you can see they've got to the point that they just don't care anymore what people think. And they're old enough and successful enough to say, you know what, I'm going to tell it like it is, you know? And I think that role has been suppressed. Uh, and that's partly why a lot of this stuff has developed. And that's what Camille Pallier was talking about six years ago, because the role of that masculine, whether it is in a female body or a male body, is not really important. But the role of the masculine- By that, you mean personality, not like gender soul. I just, I know, right? Like when you say it's in a male body or a female body, it's yes, not their gender soul. Yes. It's just the personality. Yes. yes. Just to, just I'm to clarify. About traits. Yes. I'm talking yes. about traits. In fact, this, this goes exactly to why some of these people, uh, maybe not all of them, but some of the people who are transitioning for the wrong reasons, it's exactly this problem is that they, they would like to embody more feminine traits in a male body. And they think they need to change to do that. No, you don't. And likewise with the females who think they need to embody more masculinity, you don't have to change. You can just be more masculine. There's nothing wrong with that. I mean, if you watch a video of Camille Paglia, she's like hectic. She's intense. She's full of energy. She's very aggressive. Um, doesn't suffer fools. You know, so I believe that. I accept that analysis from her. And, and, and for me, the evidence is in people like Joe Rogan, Jordan Peterson, Dr. Phil, um, to a certain extent, Bill Maher, and, and other people. There's lots of people now that have come out in the last, I'd say the last wow, three years, you know, and, and, and we're only just starting to see the impact of that. So sorry, that's my analysis of, of what you were just saying. <laughs> yeah, I mean, and I think um, in general, like this last year, there's been so much discussion about kind of the crisis. And I mean, I know people like Jonathan Haidt and, and those types have been yeah, talking exactly. about this for a few years. But in this last year, I've I've seen an even more discussion about you know, the, the male, the Gen Z crisis, um, especially of masculinity and then research indicating that young males, um, like 18 year old, a study of 18 year old males show that they're leaning more conservative. Um, and the females are leaning way, way more, um, liberal. And so we have this very interesting dynamic right now. And I hope that, you know, there's going to be a lot more momentum created, you know, just as we kind of dispel the trans illusion, which is kind of like the easy fantasy fix, like, oh, we can just liberate ourselves this way. And then the detransitioners come in and are like, actually, that's a lot more complicated. And uh, I have a whole chapter and probably more, you know, to write 
uh, in my memoir that I'm working on just about sex roles and like the evolutionary purpose of sex roles and the conclusions that I've come to who would have helped me accept my femaleness and to just take adult responsibility for my life. Um, and I, I would, I would love to see more of that coming up. Um, Imagine that. Sorry, I, I, think it will. I, have to, I have to catch that adult responsibility for my life. Brilliant. I mean, just in general, but just yeah. like for just understanding the natural, like I have a responsibility physically as a female of to mm. have need meet my own needs that males don't have and vice versa, yeah. right? Like I have menstruation, yeah. I have hormonal drives, I have reproductive drives, I have, um, you know, different emotional and relational um, tendencies that I have to take responsibility for. And in the past, I foreclosed that responsibility and was like, well, I don't want any of this. Yeah. I'm just gonna try to, you know, physically, you know, alter it. And um, that didn't work. So yeah. people like detransitioners, male and female are figuring that out. And that's why a lot of us tend to then, you know, get into people like Jordan Peterson or a lot of people get into Christianity because they're turning yeah. to something that's kind of a tried and true yes. method, you know, of, of accepting personal responsibility yeah. uh, for your biology and for your personality and integrating, you know, the shadow self and maybe your, maybe that you've you are weak feminine or you're a weak masculine mm. uh you're immature uh in your in your sex and mm. your life and um you know and integrating that weakness and then just cultivating a healthy version Developing within your it. personality yes, and behavior exactly. of of a balance of masculine and feminine so i have a whole <laughs> that's a big part of my memoir um that i'm working on so the other uh, the other, just one last thing. I mean, we we need to get, carry on with your list, but the one last thing, you know, when you look at like what you just said, okay, people are turning to Jordan Peterson. Um, I even heard about a, a someone who detransitioned because they started listening to Andrew Tate, which blew my oh, mind because I was I like, mean, Andrew that's, Tate is a, <laughs> is, a, uh, is a parasite, you know. Um, I don't know. So, maybe they were just really ready. They were just they were ready. ready. To yes. But this person explained it to me and I understand that luckily this person did realize later that, that he's running a business and it's a bit okay. of a scam. Um, and, and the point being though, you look at Dr. Phil, Joe Rogan, Jordan Peterson, um, and, and those who turn to religion, what they're looking for as it turns out, which is no surprise to any, philosopher out there is a moral authority okay and yes you can be you can be a moral authority but in the absence of guidance you you don't know what that means you don't know because that's a lot of the work that i do is i help people connect with their values um help them understand their intrinsic motivation you mentioned that earlier as well it's quite chuffed when you said that um and um i think in the you know basically it turns out that you know an elitist university with um, the, the the gender department, which is made up of uh, a very neurotic bunch of people, are not a very good source for a moral authority. You know, and the truth is, we need a moral authority because ultimately, and I want to, I want to just make something clear. You know, I'm not talking about a a um, I'm not talking about a competitive moral authority, like comparing one with the other and whatever. I'm talking about the things that help us survive on a very basic level in terms of we have morals because they come from our need to survive, our need for community, our need for autonomy. Okay, so I'm talking about like the core morals. Maybe, maybe I should say values, but it, then fine. It, it turns out that these universities are not a source of values. They're a source of indoctrination. That's, what, that's to paraphrase what you were saying earlier, you know? Mm, yeah. Um, so getting kind of back to the list, yeah, uh, I did mention my memoir that I'm working on, um, yeah. but there's been a lot of books this year that have come out. Um, one that comes to mind is When Kids Say They're Trans uh, yeah. by by Stella and Sasha and um, Lisa Marciano. Like just that that guide now exists is huge because a year or two ago, um, pe random parents, you know, would be messaging me and for advice, you know, and, and I would try to 
give them the best advice that I could from what I learned from my mentors yeah. like Stella. Yeah. Um, but but now I can just be like, just read this book. Like there is a guide. And then um Pamela, the truthful therapist, is also coming out. I think she's coming out with her guide. I think like on D-Trans Awareness Day, she picked that as the release date. So okay. like there's cool. now multiple books. Um, I believe Mary, Dr. Miriam Grossman also released her book, yeah. Lost in Transnation, yeah. um, this last year. And I'm blanking on, I mean, and I know there's a lot of books, but like yeah. just the fact now that. There's the parents know, book, the, the book that. I oh think yeah, Pit Parents. Yeah. Uh, Pit Parents. Um, I mean, I think that's an important book because it's from the parents. Oh it's yeah. About the parents. <laughs> right. Parents, uh, a bunch, uh, an anthology of parent stories. Yeah. about um their trans identified kids like there's been a lot now of not only people talking about it and and thinking about it but now they've had time to internalize it and gain gather wisdom and write about it and gather data and write about it and share it and it's just so important to have a book um or an audio book because a lot of people don't read yeah. um and yes, I will definitely have an audio book of my memoir um and then I'm really excited about this. James Lindsay um, is releasing his book, Queering the Queering of the American Child. Uh, and yeah. that's coming out um, very soon. I just gave some, um, I read it, I read it beforehand and ga gave him some feedback on it. Um, but like that book is huge because um, while not everyone is gonna, you know, some people might be intimidated by the, the more intellectual side of it, I think it's it's very comprehensive in really targeting exactly what's going on with the indoctrination, with the Marxism, why it's in K through twelve schools. Like, mm. there's a lot of uh, gaps that are being filled by these books and these films. Mm. Um, and so it's now, beautiful. you know, there's a million, you know, and one podcast that exists, and many of them I've done or interviews I've done or whatever that exist on this topic. But when it can be synthesized into a documentary or a book uh, or a memoir yeah um like that it i it's is so powerful and and that's can last forever uh no one can take that away like my editor who's who's a good friend of mine a mom actually who lost her child to the woke cult who is like my age so we have a very um kind of close relationship uh but she's also my editor for my memoir she's just like no one can ever take this book away from you. Like mm. you have it. Um, and then I got into this discussion about, you know, having physical copies of books and things, you know, a little more on the conspiracy side. Like we need to have physical books yes. um, so that we, we can have these resources. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, if, if certain happens digitally. Um, so I think just that there, there are these artifacts that exist. So many have come out this year. Um, I'm just really happy. And I know there's so many more. I'm everyone I'm sure is going to write a book now. I just hope to get my memoir out before there's like a million of them. Yeah. Um, <laughs> well, yeah. uh, look, I, I'm going to just say something about that quickly. Um, I think that's why I mentioned the pitch book, for example, you know, um, there's a lot of people who've been like me. I mean, I'm not a detransitioner. Um, a lot of people have been involved in this and the the other people have been victims of it so for me um the parents and the detransitioners themselves are the ones that need to be heard you know because okay that's that's two different stories that you're going to hear obviously but um some some i know some people like the the, the psychologists and the um, there, there are obviously some very good researchers who've, who've been enmeshed in this whole thing, um, who know a lot about it as well. Um, James Lindsay, for example, has the um, has the, the philosophical and intellectual perspective, which is very important. I, I really believe that um, uh, Benjamin Boyce, um, Wokel, um, who you know, obviously, um, James Lindsay, those guys have been decoding this for two, three years already. You know, for 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 people who are interested, if you really, because a lot of what I hear often is people don't understand this, and it's like, well, if you don't understand it, you can't fight it. Mm. You see, 
because you right. don't know where to aim. I mean, there's no point, for example, like I've had, uh, going to meetings with people that are clearly completely committed to the ideology and trying to argue with them. There's no point in that. What I'm interested in is convincing the, the masses that they need to be vigilant about it, that they need to resist it in legislation, that ultimately they need to protect the most vulnerable who, sure, we can categorize as the youngest, okay? But I, I, there's something interesting you said earlier, you know, the legislation is targeted at protecting people below 18, okay? But like you kind of insinuated that there's people between 18 and 23 that are still vulnerable. So what are we going to do about them? You know, because... Well, I, I, I think... Um... I think, you know, understanding kind of the root causes of this, exactly. because the one of their biggest arguments, the the cult's biggest argument is that, well, there's a tiny number of detransitioners, they're very rare, and they detrans they were never really trans. And so they frame it as a very personal individual failing that has no repercussions or merit yeah. within, you know, the greater discussion. But what people like James Lindsay point out is that no this is actually a systematic and systemic institutional yeah. that has that has Deliberate. decades long roots in theory and I mean one like it's been very healing now I am more of an intellectual type person so I get into this but um it's been very healing to me actually to hear what James breaks down is is talking about the concept of uh the issue is never really the issue the issue is always the revolution because yes. when you understand like, okay, it's not just a very personal, like, yeah, I, ha you know, there's chapters of my mem memoir, it's a memoir. So it's going into my personal, you know, case study, but it is a case study. It's not an isolated vacuum incident. Yes. Why was I being taught about Foucault and Judith Butler? Exactly. And that's the year that I came out as trans, right? Like James's point is that the queer issue and the trans ideology and the concept of transgender and non-binary and why it's being proliferated so strongly is that it relates to the revolution. The revolution being uh, a socialist, you know, authoritarian, radical leftist, you know, communist um, yep. takeover um, that has been documented, you know, by people like Judith Butler. Like it's oh, there. You just have to go and read it. Um, and so that's been do. very healing to me. Um, because I'm just like, wow, you know, it really takes so much weight off of me. Like, yeah, I've made some personal, you know, decisions that, that harmed me. And I was personally harmed in my particular family system had, there was, you know, relational issues, which is, you know, one-on-one -on -one type things. Yeah. But then I was, because of that, I was vulnerable to the system, to the institutionalized, um, you know, indoctrination. Yeah. In, in these in the theory exactly. so I think that's being talked about a lot more that's being exposed and um you know that's why I really am trying to con like when I do talks I try to bridge the gap between the relational and the personal emotional stuff yeah. to the systemic stuff and I'm just a case study of what's happening to you know thousands of people and even more families and family members yeah. uh, that are being affected by this. Yeah. So then uh, mm. another, so kind of on that too, like this year there's, there's been more just kind of like celebrities talking about this. Um, and like, especially I was personally really moved when kind of some old school uh, gender bending rock stars um, started talking about this, like D. Schneider of Twisted yeah. Sister, Carlos Santana, Alice Cooper, like these people that are definitely men. They're very masculine yeah. rock stars. They just come out and say, like, yeah, this is this is kind of messed up. And yeah, they're probably not like <laughs> studying James Lindsay, but you know, it's really helpful to have. Oh, just like everyday kind of, you know, men uh, mm. and gender bending rock stars criticizing mm. gender ideology and transitioning children, um, and a lot more politicians too are yeah are talking about this. Um, unfortunately, right now it's still mostly on the conservative side of things or independents. But um, I mean, we'll take I'll take that. Like Vivek Ramaswamy 
multiple times on his campaign trail, like in debates, talked about detransition. He talked about Chloe Cole, right? Like he met them. He he met Chloe and mm. um, Katie Anderson. Like he has talked to detransitioners. I would like to talk to him at some point. Um, I'm a big fan of his, but like, I just think it's a huge win that not only are kind of like the intellectuals talking about this, but yeah. like politicians and celebrities, people who have huge influence, like even just bringing it up briefly yeah. is going to make people think. Uh, uh, about Polivier, the in, in Canada, Pierre Polivier, he just, he just came out recently, like a week ago and they said it bluntly. Uh, yes. I, won't, I won't try and quote him, but he basically said that it's a problem. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Um, I mean, that's huge. Um, yeah. So I think we're going to see a lot, um, a lot more of that. And mm -hmm. of course, then there's going to be oppositional, you know, politicians and celebrities um, that that come out in favor of it, um, you know, which is it kind of sucks because it's like, can you separate the art from the artist? I can. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but it does make me feel like when the when the when my favorite, you know, bands and stuff are like based, you know, when Carlos Santana is like pretty bait, I'm like, oh. Thank God, you know, um, <laughs> just makes me love them even more. Yeah. Um, so I guess we can get into kind of more specific wins because this has been very broad. And I mean, it's amazing that it's so broad. Mm, this, I suppose um, this cultural, this cultural shifts and then the specific events that mark that yeah. culture. Right. So yeah. like just the media and the books and um, the pub, the publicity has been great but then there's been specific events that that are historic and will become um historic yeah. because this is where all these kind of people at the grassroots level are gathering and i think no more was that more clear than at the very first gen spec conference uh in ireland that both of us yep. attended we were both there. Uh, yeah and it was just such a it was so powerful amazing um, yeah. it was so powerful that um <clears throat> that a think tank was created out of it, the Killarney group, mm. um, just because there was so many, you know, there was detransitioners, there was journalists, there was um, doctors there. And it just felt like, wow, you know, some we're finally mm. doing some like the, and the point of having these conferences is an alternative to WPATH. Yeah. So we're trying to have a more health focused approach versus an activist approach. Um, and so in that regard, you know, a lot of people, you know, have had a really successful role in what they do in terms of lobbying or um, parental support or or more of the act, uh, advocacy stuff for the movement. But no one else has really tackled the the health and the research side of things as much as Genspact has. Yeah, yeah exactly. Um, exactly. So, I mean... Like, mm. and I'm definitely talking about that in my book. Like, it's just, it's, I think it was so powerful for everyone. Um, and yeah, it really say, opened up the conversation. Okay. Yeah, let me, let me say this about that conference. Um, I just want, I just want people that don't know about it or, or haven't heard, you know, exactly what we're talking about. WPATH was having their conference in Kalani Island and uh, Jens Beck went and had their conference nearby at the same time. Okay, which I think was incredibly brave. Right. Do I need to say that again? <laughs> because it's very easy for people to say, ah, well, they did this wrong and they did that wrong and they did whatever, but you don't understand what it takes for the 200 and I think 60 odd people that attended that conference in person, that it took courage, you know, to go there and, and, and wear a Genspect badge, you know, um, in the in the face of um, the, the 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 tyranny of the left, basically. Um, but I just want to point out as well two things. Uh, that conference was a very liberal conference. Okay, I don't want anyone to even contemplate that this was because I saw a phrase the other day in a, in a, in, a, in another thread that called the, the people who are critical of trans ideology a bunch of old middle-aged white women, okay, which is absurd, okay? First of all, I'm none of those things, all right? Well, I'm middle-aged, but I'm not doing the other stuff. Um, so first of all, 
even I felt like I was surrounded by a bunch of very liberal socialists who just happened to agree on this issue, to be honest, okay? Because I've moved more center since living in South Africa, which, which will make do that to anybody. Um, so for me, it was, it was really interesting to be in that space and pretty much anyone I spoke to, because we did a lot of talking after each uh, session, some of us stayed up till one in the morning talking on those, on those nights. And everybody was very liberal. We're very liberty minded people, you know? So I just wanna make that point. And then also another point, which I've just recently become aware of is that um, WPATH membership has crashed. Maybe it's coincidence, but since May, 2023, the, the, the WPATH membership has collapsed. Okay, it's gone from, I think it was 4,000 something to about 1,300 or something. Okay, so I don't know what the reasons are exactly, but I think it is significant that the impact is being felt, that people are starting to question, they're starting to go back to their original ethics. Um, even in the meeting that I had with uh, people who are doing affirmation protocols in South Africa, even they were very cautious. They said they're aware of the studies in Europe, the studies in Sweden and, and the UK, and um, it's even Denmark and Finland. They were aware of them, they'd read them, um, and they had a meeting with us to, to discuss these things. As I said, a year ago, that wouldn't have happened, you know? So we, we and this is what we're doing in this, in this recording, you know, is we're just pointing out, okay, uh, the, maybe there's lots of other things that we haven't, um, that we, you and I haven't remembered or paid attention to, and, and, and people can put those in the comments, obviously, you know? But it's significant that that conference happened. And whatever else you say about Genspect, Genspec was the one that had the courage to do that, was the, was the group that had the courage to do that. And of course, they had the, um, the Denver conference as well in the same year, uh, which I know had mixed, mixed results. But uh, anyway, you carry on with the list because we're, we're still getting there. Well, yeah, I mean, um, so a couple of things first, like just the, I think another huge win in general is just the alliances that have been made. Yeah. Like, you know, very unlikely friendships, like, it, you know, yeah. meeting people in person at the conference or, or other places. <laughs> yeah, me and you, well, we were already an unlikely friendship before this year, last year, but like we wouldn't have connected without this, you know, no. being, being, being outraged and concerned and curious about this. Mm -hmm. But like just politically, I think a lot of people are are finding common ground. Like I attended a Heritage Foundation event. It's like, I never could see myself, you know, getting involved with like Christians or conservative Christians or events like, you know, coming yeah. from, from my background um, and being a secular person. But here I am at so many events now where it's just people like me, more like independent minded people or people that are more left than I am completely getting along and being genuine friends um, and colleagues with people that have different political views or who vote differently. Um, so I think it's completely turning things upside down in terms of mm, mm. how how people are viewing liberalism, how they're viewing leftism and how they're viewing conservatism. Um, and I think people who are awakened to this are a lot more open-minded and they are more liberal. They're more mm. liberal in the sense of prioritizing free speech and free association. And, you know, um, they just seem more balanced. Mm. versus the people that are on the extremes of the cult or who haven't awoken to this, they still seem trapped in a very limited mindset about conservative and liberalism and who they can associate with. And it's a lot more authoritarian versus, I mean, not that there is not some authoritarian or unwell people who, you know, hold certain similar opinions as we do in the movement, mm. There mm. are, but yeah. generally yeah. It, it's a very calm, it's a very um, respectful, very welcoming um, yeah. events and environments that, that I've attended. And is someone who is not Christian, um, you know, people like, I get tons of prayers, like everywhere I go now, people are like, can I pray for you? And like all these things that I never thought that I would be um interested in I actually mm. have come to appreciate um and it's just it's been so um 
like even though there's a ton of political turmoil in so many different ways, um, just the kind of uh, alliances that have been formed, like between mm-hmm. between gays and and Christians, for example, mm-hmm. or between men and women. It's almost, uh, it's almost as if, almost as if we're discovering our shared humanity. <laughs> You know, because what yeah, I'm thinking, protecting yeah, maybe, children. As you're describing that, it's like, you know, what we all agree on is, I mean, look at this, like you're from America, I'm from South Africa, I've spoken to people in Australia, in, in, in Poland, in Finland, all over the world, okay? And what we are doing is we're discussing our shared humanity because no one, I know there's some people that are doing this, but generally none of us are suggesting that we replace um, gender ideology with something else. What we're saying is just slow down. That's what we're saying. We're saying, yes, we understand that there's people with gender dysphoria, but we need to stop medically altering them. That's what that's all we're saying. So it's not a it's not a it's like I said earlier, you know, it's not a matter of competing ideologies. The one is an ideology and the other one is humanity. Mm. That's it. Right. Yeah. Um, so, so yeah, the Killarney conference then inspired um, the the Denver conference. So they have two mm-hmm. conferences in a year the, the, because they're doing one at the same time as the European WPATH and American WPATH. Um, the Denver conference was also extremely successful. Um, again, just meeting of, of, of unlikely friendships. Like I met James Lindsay for the first time there and now we're friends and it's like what like you know just mm-hmm. a couple of years ago you see these people like and they're this weird this you know some like famous person talking now you're friends with them now you're just sitting and talking with them like a human being yeah. Yeah. um so like that conference also was extremely successful and um you know there's just going to be continuing to be events like that mm. uh, another conference I found really successful was uh the partners for ethical care event um in in austin texas um and it seems like you know there's different groups that are kind of doing their own thing partners for ethical care does more um of like american specific legal political action um but like you know because i've attended both conferences now i've met so many different people Um, And it's like, you know, there's just so many more avenues for collaboration opened. Um, Let's see, what else is on the list? Um, I think what's huge this year is, hmm? oh yeah, D-Trans Help. So, and more and more kind of organizations have been forming, like Mm. maybe there's, there was a couple that were already around like Our Duty Mm. or Do No Harm was or fair in medicine was already existing yeah but in the last year many more chapters have opened up like yeah. there's a lot more gays against groomers chapters like, in different states yeah or um our duty chapters in different countries yeah uh, moms for liberty in a lot more places like different like people are clearly getting inspired by the grassroots stuff and then creating their own actions yeah so it's spreading around and people are more connected now um so uh and then D-Trans Help was formed. Uh that's a detransitioner run organization. Mm. Um and then, you know, more, I mean, I, I like just as we as we speak, there I mean there's a lot of different people I know are working and very passionately creating more resources um for detransitioners for getting healthcare. Um and so uh I mean like it's again it's hard to remember everything that's happened but like i know that there's things happening right now um that aren't even out yet um one of that would be the wpath files um the wpath files are you know there's been a lot of leaked documents and different you know internal reporting and things about wpath um that are going to be exposed in in the coming year I think that's going to be enormous. And um, to that effect, another win this year was Jamie Reed. I don't know exactly if she came out with her story in 2023 or if it was 2022, Mm -hmm. but Jamie Reed um, 
has has been doing so much good work this year. She's a whistleblower uh, that she worked in a gender clinic and she transitioned or helped transition children Mm -hmm. and now is speaking out about that. There was just another whistleblower. um, Mm -hmm. I think her name is Pam, forgetting her last name at this moment. Uh, But, you know, I'm really inspired by how many whistleblowers we're seeing, uh, Mm -hmm. whether it be parents speaking out for their children or leaking videos to libs of TikTok, you know, or independent uh, journalists talking about this. Yeah. Um, But now there's whistleblowers from gender clinics coming out and the WPATH files are hopefully going to spark, you know, a flood of even more. Um, um, And then another, um, just something that's enormous is just the amount of lawsuits that were filed this last year, detransitioners um, have filed in various countries. And I know my case is still being worked on right now. I have not filed yet. Um, and so I know that a lot of people are in the same boat as I am. Mm. But one of the one of the detransitioners, um, she just came out with a lawsuit against the American Academy of Pediatrics itself. Like she is suing one of the biggest, you know, leading organizations um you know this is sort of like america's tavistock in in a way um so i mean just like that can't even be stated enough how big of a win that these lawsuits are because it means that you know that people who were harmed are you know getting help they're getting resources and they're speaking out and they're using their voices and spreading yeah. this message. And, and that there's a there's a legal foundation. I think that's yes. very important. And to that effect, there's at least two uh, legal you know, um, resources for detransitioners now. There's the the Jordan Campbell law firm, and there's now the theme themis resource fund. Um, these are both like specifically working on advocating legally for detransitioners. Yeah. Um, there's also uh, Transition Justice run by Partners for Ethical Care. So now in this last year, we're seeing, you know, legal resources, which is really crucial because in most cases, there's a time limit for when you can bring your case. And we ha- we're seeing this problem where there's a lot of detransitioners who have privately come out and they feel they've been harmed, but they're afraid because this is obviously yep. unprecedented um, and there's such a backlash. And so to have these public cases is very important because we need people to file so that they can actually seek justice legally, yep. but also so that other people um are inspired to also have courage and and know that they'll have support for when for so that they can bring their case in the time limit like i'm one of those people like for i do transition a couple of years ago i i um you know didn't even realize the extent of the harm that was done to me honestly until mm-hmm. last year when i heard other people coming out with their lawsuits and it was at the partners for ethical care event which was in was in April of t- oh, really? last year. So that's when it really hit you. Yeah, like, I mean, really? it was, you know, I had it deprogrammed, you know, and continuously deprogrammed and had grief and different things, but I didn't fully understand that it wasn't like a personal failing of mine that actually yeah. there was a, there was egregious violation of, of medical ethics done by my providers. Yeah. And I only really understood that once I, it was modeled to me through other detransitioners and my peers who were filing cases and then me speaking to lawyers and them being like, yeah, absolutely. Like, absolutely. You have a very compelling case. Um, So there's a lot of people like that were in my position uh, or that are right now who, who are afraid because they kind of want to see how these cases play out. And unfortunately, there just isn't enough time. And so, you know, having more legal resources and and seeing these lawsuits publicly 
um, we're really building a coalition of of mm. of support, peer support for for detransitioners, um, so that you know they don't have to mm. feel like martyrs because now there's so many of us. Sure, I just I just sorry I have to catch that, like emphasize how important what you just said is because. And I've never heard you say it like that um, because, you know, we did our podcast, you know, three years ago. Um, we met at the, the conference in May last year. And you're telling me that actually it was at this other conference that you really felt that, okay, you were kind of um, not absolved, I suppose, but um, in a way absolved, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I know, I mean, I know people are going to be quick to say, well, you still take responsibility for your decisions. Yes, but um, we've known about, you know, the reason for ethics in medicine is because we know that it can do harm, that there's a, a trust and power dynamic between the, the, the patient and the professional. You know, we know it. This isn't news. This isn't something we need to argue about. We've known about this for 100 years, you know. Um, so for you to say that, even you, I mean, I, I consider you quite a resilient lady, okay? And I've, I've told you this before. But for you to tell me now that even though we've done all that work, you've done all that work already, it was being at that particular event and, and having the, the culmination of the legal and the medical and the psychological and the victims um, coming together that finally gave you that sense of relief. You know, yes, it was just, hearing... Hearing a lawyer discuss, yeah. um, like what was ethically going on, yeah, and and the cases that were being brought, and then hearing, and then, um, befriending other detransitioners that I had only known online, like Prisha Mosley. That was the first mm -hmm. time I met her in person. Was um last April at that same event, and now we've become good friends. And she filed her lawsuit, I believe in October or November or, um, yeah. or November of this year. And so now I've had, like, I've now formed real friendships. So it isn't this nebulous kind of abstract thing that's exactly. like, well, okay, it's not my fault, but also like, I still really feel like it is or yeah. whatever there, you know, other people are trying to tell me for a couple, you know, a couple of years, people have been trying to tell me that, you know, it's not your fault. Like it's the doctors and stuff. And I was like, Oh, thank you. Or whatever. But it didn't really internalize until I was face to face with peers of mine who had the same thing. And then I could see them and be like, oh no, these people were really, these were victims. So it's easier to see other people as victims yeah. than it is yourself. Yes, exactly. Um, and so, yeah, it's really only, only very recently that, um, that I really felt like relieved of the impact um, yeah or not the impact, but like the guilt that I felt. And the, the responsibility also... as well. It's, there's a, you know, I mean, I know we were just talking about taking personal responsibility, but we all take personal responsibility in the context of community. Okay. The, the, the idea that this relates to um, this concept of co-regulating or self-regulating, um, you you first have to learn how to co-regulate with other human beings. And that involves ethics, you know? Um, there's an idea, it, which is, I think, tied up with the postmodernist idea, but this idea that you are, you know, the individual supreme, you know, and because you're the individual supreme, uh, the individualistic uh, culture that is being uh, uh, promoted, you know, the narcissism, the cluster B, that's all related. And it's an idea that you can and should self-regulate. You don't need others, you know, and it, 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 it's really, to me, uh, a lovely outcome of the session that we can talk about all these events, but from your personal experience that even with the support and the therapy and the podcasting and whatever that you did, it took being at, at a, at a, at a um, accumulation of all those people and all the resources and all the support for you to truly feel that, oh, okay, I can leave this behind, I can move on. I mean, I know you're still dealing with, you know, the consequences of, of things that happened. I know that. But um, it's, it's a very powerful statement that all these things that we're talking about are having dramatic effects 
on, and pr we'll probably never know how many people, you know, how many people are not going to trans transition because they heard about just one of these events, you know, and there's a whole list of them, things that you and I just thought up, you know. Right. Like, that's the thing. Like, I get told, you know, and I still kind of struggle with, with, with complex trauma, you know, from other yeah. things like core, core wounds and stuff. Yeah. But, um, you know, you're getting told, like, people have been telling me, like, oh, you're helping so much. You're saving so many people. And it's like, it kind of, like, it's hard to internalize that until you actually are in person. Yeah. That's a huge part yeah. of this, being yeah. in person at these events, you know, put on by organizations like Genspect, um, you know, you where you can actually physically meet these people and, and see their humanity and then see your humanity yes. through them and through their eyes because you're both you know, seeking the same thing um, and feeling, you know, trying mm. to understand who you are and what the hell is going on mm -hmm. in life. Um, so yeah, and just overall, just the, just like a year or so ago, like I had just met Dietrin, like certain people who are now really close friends of mine, um, like Chloe Cole or Prisha Mosley or, or other detransitioners, like I didn't like now I text them like every day, but I had just met these people a year ago. And so, so much can happen in a year in, in terms of friendships in this yeah. movement. Um, and there's, and there's just so many other people, so many other people. Um, and, um, but especially the detransitioners, because it's one thing to have support online and it's another to have, you know, a support group that you can go to or yeah. have videos of people talking about it. Like that's really important, but really there's nothing that can compare to just hanging out. Like yeah. last year was the first time I met Chloe this year for my birthday. Um, she took me out to California and we hung out for like two weeks. Like we just, and we did events and stuff too, but like we just hung out and had it like, and it just, it can change so, so much when, when yeah. you can really physically spend quality time with, with open-minded, real and honest people. Yeah. And, and that's what really has moved. I mean, obviously I've been quite excited this whole time, like, ah, there's so much good stuff, like gratitude, but that's what I'm personally most grateful for is, is the friendships that I've made with with peers like I never thought mm -hmm. I never thought I would have like peers my own age no offense Vincent um <laughs> no, no, that's fine <laughs> yeah but I mean I still have a lot that are older too um yeah. personally uh I'll just give a shout out to my friend Yvette who I also met at the same event in Austin and she's the one who invited me to stay with her in Albuquerque this summer and I stayed for an entire month um, and now I'm planning to move to Albuquerque, New Mexico. Oh, wow. So she helped me introduce the community there. And, and she's like in her, um, in her sixties, like, so like, it's, it's just crazy how, how, um, many friendships have been formed, not in just in my life, but in all of our lives. And I think yeah. it's good to focus on the real friendships that we have versus like the couple people that, that are at each other's throats online exactly. who we're not exactly. actually friends with so I, I i don't know if you were deliberately leading up to the the beyond trans support group was a direct result of meeting with detransitioners at the kalani genspec conference okay i was with you obviously we were having some drinks um i, I mean I, we, we were we were talking about doing something um but i was kind of busy with my own stuff um uh, I was involved with the um, crisis call center in South Africa, and and I was quite busy with that kind of the whole male uh, males in distress, um, male suicide, all that kind of stuff. Anyway, I came to the conference. We we just happened to be having drinks, and I, I just love the idea that this like it, it it came out of this pub in Ireland, literally, you know, because that's what happened. I was sitting at that at that when that one night we were all sitting. There was a whole bunch of us at a table, and it was as far as I remember, it was all detransitioners except for me. Um, and I was picking up on all the conversations and a couple of uh, the people in the corner were directing, engaging me directly. Um, later on, you joined me and we got really deep into stuff. And I just realized that um, 
what I was getting from all of them. And then I went and, and, and contacted some other people, some other detransitioners online and had meetings with them as well. So I ended up talking to a whole bunch of people about this, this, this idea that they were betrayed by other professionals, but don't trust professionals in their recovery. And as I said earlier, they don't have a diagnosis to say this person is diagnosed with detransition. I mean, obviously that would be silly, but, but, but it doesn't trigger something. So you don't go to a detransitioner counselor, okay? Which is maybe what I am now. But anyway, that, that, that's, that's not what I'm getting at. What I'm getting at is that I just recognize the need, okay? Um, I validated that need by having more meetings with people to show that that was a real thing. Um, and as you know, I mean, getting detransitioners to attend a meeting is like herding cats, okay? No, anyone who's detransitioned listening to this, you know exactly what I mean, okay? Having said that though, um, we've had lots of meetings. We've been meeting once a week since June last year. And for me, it's been, and I think for them, it's been incredible. And, and what's actually what's happened is it's been quite a, uh, a sort of open door kind of meeting uh, scenario where there's not many of them, but they come in, they join when they can. Um, I ended up uh, uh, committing uh, to regular female detransitioner groups um, because the males were functioning better um, doing like voice notes and and the odd meeting and and texts and that kind of thing. Um, and anyway, what was quite interesting was the males were a bit older for some reason, whereas the female of, of the female group is very mixed, very mixed. Um, so so I just want to like point out that when we talk about how these things kind of lead on to each other, you know, the fact that there's a, a detransition of support group being provided for, it's been provided for by, for free. Um, thanks to some very kind donations that get made to to Beyond Trans, um, and what that and obviously there's there's a certain amount of um, uh, time, let, let's say, volunteering on my part as well, because the, the amount of time that it takes is not really what I get paid for. I get paid just to hold the meeting. Okay, I get a fee just for that, but actually it takes up a lot more time, probably three times the amount of time in general. Um, so just to acknowledge that there's a lot of people committed to, to undoing the damage that was done, the ethics that were broken, and it involves the detransition is speaking, but sometimes it involves being in the right place at the right time to hear what they're saying, because not all detransitioners have the stones that you have, Laura. Okay. Excuse the, the mixed metaphor, you know, but, um, but that's the thing. I mean, we were sitting at that dinner, at, at that table, at, at that pub in, in Ireland, and I think a lot of the stuff that was said was a little bit of um, um, Guinness courage, you know, because, because people had had a drink or two and they were being more honest, you know. And I was paying attention. I was like, no, no, no. I wanted to know. I'm very grateful that I entered psychology in midlife, that I had nothing to do with this developing, because it's it's easier for me to say, you know what, they really messed up, and we need to do something about that. So. So speaking to, to, so just to be specific, it was a consequence of the conference. Um, it allows me to speak to detransitioners almost every day, okay? In one way or the other, whether it's the group, obviously the group doesn't run every day, it runs once a week. Um, but because of the group, I speak to detransitioners pretty much every day. Um, and I, I speak to some trans people as well. It's, 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 it's quite a mixed bag, although they're not in the group, obviously. Um, but when you get to the point that um, you've got these organizations that do something, you've got events that happen, and then you've got people that actually benefit and they have a sense of hope again, which I think is the really important point. So the people that have the courage to go to, go to court about these things are just one of maybe 10,000 other people who could go to court. So just, right. I just wanted to rub that in, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Um... And it's good, you know, and obviously there's still some gaps that, that there's a lot, there's a lot of problems in the world. Uh, we haven't solved all oh, of them yeah. this year, uh, but, oh, yeah. you know, we're working on it um, in our own ways. And, you know, the healthier that even just if one person becomes healthy, not to brag that I'm either that I'm healthy or that I'm like the person, but just in my, like in the help that Jen Specht and others have done for me in the last couple of years, I am now co competent and confident to now help a lot of other people. So the more that we help, um, the more 
you know, that there's more healthy, you know, decent yeah. people that are out there that can, um, that can help other people in, in so many different ways. Um, so, and it, it, that's why it's just so nice to see, just meet, I'm just meeting so many, so mm. many more, whether it just be online or in real life or both. Um, I'm just meeting some really good, loving, genuine people. Yeah. And ultimately that's what I always needed all along. I just yes. needed to not exactly. be alone, you know, and to, to be accepted and for who I really am and, and take responsibility for, for helping others too. Um, mm. I'm glad you so, said that because my, my, in the support group, the support groups are very, um, it's not therapeutic. Okay. It's, it's, it's life skills motivated. Um, I pay attention to whether they are motivated at all or not. And obviously there's quite quite varying degrees of that. But the one thing I do keep reiterating is they have to convert the skills that they practice in the group. They have to convert them to real life relationships. Okay. So I'm very glad that you said that because when we, if you go back, even if people could go back and look at our podcast that we did three years ago, and I think you can see the difference where you've come from, Laura, it's a massive difference. Yes. Um, and, and I know this, this might be obvious to some people, but, what we're talking about here are things related to your autonomy and things related to your competencies and things related to your relatedness. Okay. Those are the three core components of self-actualization. Okay. So mm -hmm. yeah, exactly. Um, and that's from research. I mean, that's something that we found when we analyzed the, the studies on, on, on people that are uh, self-actualizing, you know? So you must just remember as well. Um, and, and everyone that's, that's doing this work is that, Maybe this will all blow over eventually, but the, the things, the competencies that you're developing are going to be translated into something else, you know? So recovery is about building competency and, and building skills and um, self-actualizing, which can never go wrong. It can never be a bad thing, you know? Right. And I know that many people... Well, it's kind of like when in a, a substance abuser goes in, you know, for, to rehab and the person, the doctor says, you know, you know, good job in finding something that works for you, something that yeah. helps you. Survive. Yeah. That's how detransition is. And you're actually the one who told me that years ago, you were like, I didn't. well, I, sorry, transition helps you survive. You said yeah. transition, helps you survive. Um, and I'm like, yeah. oh, shit, it did. Um, but it, so it's like, that's how I view oh, shit. Now I'm losing my train of thought. Um, but uh, basically, but once you understand, we, we we thought that 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 was going to be our self actualization by transitioning. We thought yes. we were self actualizing, and that's why my book that I'm writing is um, called "Quirky Not Queer: The Detransition Journey," because. I thought that I was going on the hero's journey and in some ways I was. And I thought the result of that transition was the hero's journey and that I would become yes. self-actualized through that. But it was actually a much longer and more, you know, meandering process of the hero's journey that involved exactly. detransitioning, which is his own, is. you know, exactly. thing. I love like, that. I love that. Yeah. That's awesome. It's a good title, yeah. 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 So, um that's, that's i forgot that i told you that um and i'll tell you let me just explain to people that are listening that comes from my experience with anorexia so i had anorexia between 16 and 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 23 i was severely underweight it wasn't um it wasn't um you know it was it was caused by orthorexia but um i was definitely anorexic i was clinically anorexic okay and and i remember later many years later just understanding that um, I, I was suicidal before I became anorexic. So I started like, as I, as I you know, I suppose my brain matured, you know, um, keep in mind as a man that's around 33. Um, so uh, I just remember like understanding that it was, a, it was a way to cope. It was a way to survive. It was a way to um, filter out the the threats but also the stimulation of the world the challenges of the world the even the opportunities that might sound weird but actually when you're when you're uh, a little bit adhd and a little bit ocd and 
um, trying to develop your emotional intelligence. It's, it's way too much information. You know, I'm just looking at that image behind you and it's a good representation of exactly what I'm talking about. You know, it's like this flood of, of, of textures and colors and, um, and when your mind is not coping, it finds ways. It'll be alcohol. I've, I've struggled with alcohol as well. It'll be drugs. It'll be anorexia. The effect is, I always say, what is the outcome of your behavior? That is the, the goal is the outcome. And my, the outcome of my behavior being anorexic and, and drinking at the same time was to narrow down my, my choices. I, I, I narrowed down my world and I was like, okay, I've got two choices. Instead of having 10, I had two and I, I grew up poor. So it's not like I was doing this in a, in a wealthy uh, environment. I, I already had limited uh, uh, options, but to absolve myself of, of, the, um, of the responsibility to make the right decision, which I really wasn't prepared to make. I really wasn't prepared yeah. for that. I, I didn't have the skills to make the right decision. Uh, I mean, I know you know this, but I, I had no parents to, to guide me from the age of 16. Um, I, hardly any adults at all to guide me. So it was a way of coping, you know? So I, I understand that that's a very unique scenario that I've just described. But when I was, I remember that day when we were talking about this and it, we weren't recording, I don't think it was. No, we were recording. Were we? It's oh, recording. okay. Yeah, it's episode oh, cool. uh, two, yeah. Oh, cool, okay, because, um, because I just remember the more you were talking, I was like, oh my God, I did the same thing. You know, it, and, and I think we need to be honest that, yes, we need to figure out why they get, why you guys get to that stage. Obviously we need to figure out, we need to prevent this. But I'm just saying, I think it helps us to understand that from their perspective, it's a coping mechanism, which is why I get so upset when some people make out like I'm, like I'm a transphobe. No, it's actually the opposite. You're completely misunderstanding what I'm doing. I don't know about other people, but what I'm doing is I'm concerned because I've been there. Okay, I didn't transition, but I've been in that frame of mind where I thought if I limit all my options, then I'll survive, you know? And I want to mm. repeat what I said. I was suicidal before I became anorexic, okay? And coming out of anorexia was quite difficult as well, but it wasn't as hard. It wasn't as hard as the moment that I was suicidal. I, I, I actually did get to the point of attempting, uh, when I was very young, I'm talking about when I was 13, okay? Uh, but keep in mind, you know, I converted to atheism when I was 11. So I was a, an early developer, you know? Um, but the point is of like getting to the suicidal mindset, um, I saw no future, none. I had no hope. I thought the world was evil and I wanted out, okay? When I was anorexic, I was like, the world is complicated and I need to watch my options. That's a totally different thing, you know, but I was experiencing love. I was experiencing growth. There were still some things going on. And that's what I do with sometimes with the parents, sometimes with the, the transitioners and even the detransitioners is to make them aware that. And I know we, we're doing another video, by the way, you'll, you'll see it's a beautiful animated video. Um, with another detransitioner talks about this, what I'm talking about now, which is even in detransition, um, there's lots of positives going on and people need to, pay attention to that, that there's a, there's a growth curve involved in, in, which is kind of what you've just been saying, you know, um, but the growth curve comes from the detransition curve or sorry, the trans curve, you know, there's yes. trans waves of change that I, that I wrote about a, a few months ago. Um, but I think we need to sort of acknowledge that it's these waves and they lead to growth as long as there isn't the complete absence of hope, because that becomes uh, suicidality you know sorry I'm, I'm i'm doing a ted talk now so we should probably end just now but what we else do you wanna... well i think i mean yeah there's a reason we did a podcast and perhaps we should do more more yeah. talks uh different times but um i think we pretty covered this um the, the topic every, today. The topic yeah i mean there's just so much um inspiration and even just for my personal calendar, like of big things that are coming up, there's a lot um, just, and that's just me. And like, just in general, like when the WPATH files come out and even I think um, like for in America, this election, it's an election year. Like yeah. this issue is a very 
prevalent issue. It's gonna, it's gonna be prevalent, yeah. Yeah. Too many others. So it's gonna be crazy. I've never said it was gonna be crazy or normal in any way, but it is going to be um, progress. And maybe there's gonna be some two steps forward, one step back. And there's gonna be a lot of that probably, just, not just politically, but just in everything that we try to do. Um, but we're still making progress and we're still, you know, doing good work. And there's still a lot of people that are being helped, mm -hmm. um, in a lot of different ways. And, you know, people are just going to keep healing and they're going to keep growing. And, yeah. um, yeah, I'm, I'm very, very hopeful, very hopeful, uh, which, you know, it, I don't always say that, uh, mm -hmm. you know, so <laughs> I, clearly I don't always say that. But I actually am very hopeful about about the impact that we're making and that I'm making, yeah. and um, just just there's just so much good that I'm finding. Um, and I guess there's one more win that I think maybe tops it off, which is that the New York Times uh, just published an essay about detransition, That's and this awesome. is huge. Because, um, you know, previously it's just been independent, more conservative media talking about this, but now it is reaching like the mainstream of the mainstream, um, you know, left leaning audience. Yeah. Um, and so I wasn't expecting that to happen like right away in, you know, January or February, but um, yeah. I, I just think that's just such a positive sign um so so yeah think, uh, happy happy I'm gonna, trans awareness i'm yeah. gonna just highlight and uh, we can end now but i'm just gonna highlight um maybe we can we can use this as a title for this session um but you saying that you're hopeful okay um, <laughs> i don't want to take it back but <laughs> No, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to hold you to that as well. Okay, um, okay. But if nothing else, you know, if we're achieving that, that we're giving yeah, trans huge. and detrans people hope, okay, that, that trans people can find better ways to, to deal with their gender dysphoria and detransitioners can find better ways to, to move forward with their lives. Because remember, some of them have got iatrogenic harm, which is going to take time to heal, you know. Um, uh, the word hope, I think, is just is just perfect. You know, the fact that all these events culminate in creating a more hopeful atmosphere. You know, and and that's hope is the antidote to to depression. You know, um, hope is it drives all human motivation ultimately. If you if you take away hope, you have nihilism. You know, um, so that's beautiful. I think I think we should we should end it there. And um, like you say, I suspect we'll do another one somewhere soon about something else yeah. related. I'm sure. Well, we should. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Laura. Thank you, Vincent. <laughs>